We can also consider the energy to be associated with the magnetic field itself where we've got this EMF going in the opposite direction and the current coming from A to B. Now the source supplying the current needs to maintain that potential difference here because if the current is increasing it's producing this EMF that's opposing it. Well to keep that going the source itself must maintain that potential difference between its terminals. So a battery for example will always try and uh, keep the same voltage. To maintain that if it's got to go against an EMF then obviously it requires power. So it must supply energy to the inductor. The instantaneous power P supplied by the current source is P equals the electromotive force times the current, which is that standard equation for power. In this case, we know that the, uh, the EMF is given by this inductance, so we can say that we can plug that in to here, and we end up with Li di by dt. So the energy dw supplied in time dt is simply P dt, which is a little bit of the energy times the power multiplied by the time, then we end up with this equation number two. Now the total energy supplied while the current increases from zero to a final value I, we'll sum up all these little energy parts uh, throughout the whole of the change in I here, and so we can just uh, take the integral of that side and then form the integral of naught to I on this side, okay, so we're summing up all these I's, and if we do that then the, the zero part goes and we end up with a half L I squared. So that's basically the energy in joules when we increase from zero to I in that inductor. Now after current has reached its final steady state value, the change in current is not going to change anymore, and uh, so that's zero, and the power input is zero. The energy that has already been supplied to the inductor is needed to establish the magnetic field in and around the inductor. We can also consider the energy be associated with the magnetic field itself by considering a very simple case. The toroidal solenoid, this system has the advantage that its magnetic field is confined completely to a finite region in space in its interior. So you can see it's, it's confined completely in here. Uh, we've done a similar example just previous to this. Here we assume the cross-sectional area A is small enough that we consider the magnetic field to be uniform over the area. Uh, as we did before. The volume is in the toroid is then approximately equal to the circumferential length L equals 2 pi R multiplied by the area A. The volume then is going to be 2 pi R multiplied by A. Now the self-inductance L of a toroidal solenoid is given as this where n is the number of turns, l is the length of the circumference again. When current in windings is i, the energy stored in toroid is, the energy is this. So then we just replace the l in here and we end up with this equation here. To get the energy density, capital U, energy per unit volume, we think of this energy w as localised in the volume enclosed by the windings equal to l times a. Therefore, the energy density, capital U, is W over LA here. We can then write half UI N squared I squared over L squared here. Now, using the equation for magnetic field in a toroid we saw in a previous lecture, this B equals U more NI over L, squaring and rearranging that, we find N squared I squared over L squared, this, equals b squared over mu naught squared. So we can just plug that straight in and substitute this back into, into 3 then. We get the useful result that uh, the energy density, or in other words the energy per unit volume in an inductor is given by b squared, now that applies to any inductor actually, it's b squared over 2 mu naught. This is the uh, analogue of the expression for the energy per unit volume in the electric field of uh, an air capacitor, which was half epsilon naught e squared, if you remember that. The energy per unit volume in the electric field of an air capacitor was given as, let's call it UC, a half epsilon naught, and the field, the electric field squared, the magnitude electric field squared. So that, so that there is for the capacitor and this now is for the energy per unit volume in an inductor. So we've got the energy per unit volume for a capacitor, we've calculated that before, 
and now we have the energy per unit volume for an inductor. That's going to be very useful later on when we are discussing EM waves, so just wanted to go through that, this quick example. 